Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Soul Patrol, Jesus 911, two man, no, not two man car, three man car. On Wednesdays, uh, Eddie, we got we, just, uh, you got uh, two guys, you know, out there patrolling the field, but on Wednesdays, we usually bring in a sharpshooter. <laughs> yup. Because sometimes the street cops can't handle it. We got to bring in SWAT sometimes. And on Wednesdays, we not only bring in SWAT, we bring in the sharpshooters. We bring in Kyle Clement and uh, Dan Schneider. And today we got Kyle. Kyle, how are you, my friend? Very good. Very good. Good to see you guys. Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, uh, for all the all the people out there watching, anticipating this Wednesday's show, we're 10-8. We're on duty. Three-man car. And uh, our call letter is John 316. We've got some uh, very engaging topics today that are going to uh, provide a lot of intel, a lot of Catholic intel, a lot of Catholic information to the audience out there. First thing we want to talk about, uh, Eddie and Kyle, is uh, the whole the, the whole mystery behind the, these figures or a figure called the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6 and following. Let me read the, the passage, and then the question is, a lot of Protestants say these are demons. These are demons that were having sexual intercourse with human beings. So I want to get the Catholic response, but here's what the Bible says, then we'll let Kyle, give us some exegesis based on tradition and scripture. The scripture says, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of men came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. Now, a lot of Protestant exegetes will say that these were giant fallen angels, and uh, the question is, Kyle, what has the church taught about this from the patristics, the fathers of the church? What's the Catholic thought on the Nephilim? You bring up a very, very good point, and it gives us an it gives us a reference or an opportunity to look at um, theology uh, in an emerging, developing theology over a long period of time. So let's go back and pick up the subject uh, in its totality. You first hear of this reference of angelic beings or otherworldly beings or demigods um, in the book of Jubilees. It's an apocryphal Jewish text that was written around 100 B.C. And it's it's an account basically that goes back and, and giants or hybrid creatures, supernatural creatures, um, have had a place in human history no matter what um, their particular race or culture. And so there will be a reference to them when the scouts are sent uh, out of the desert to scout the land of Cana. And so they refer to the giant people that they encounter there um, as these creatures, these, uh, these hybrid creatures, if you will. We bring that understanding into the first century, and there's quite a list of renowned theologians uh, in the Catholic Church, first through fourth century, who ascribe to this view as it is written. And that is that angels uh, cohabitate, cohabitated and copulated with humans, and there was a race of hybrid creatures. Hmm. So that's that was the view up until the fourth century. And the apologist who basically set that view uh, aside and said, we're not, we're no longer going to teach it because it's not consistent with known theology was no other than St. Augustine. So he gives us the definitive answer that um, we're no longer adhering to that um, interpretation, which was a Jewish interpretation brought into the church through some of the early fathers, such as Justin Martyr, Clement of Rome, um, and uh, Ambrose and others. Augustine says um, that the more correct interpretation and a more in-depth study says that the Son of God reference is to those of Seth, Seth, his line, the the line that adhered to uh, 
sacrifice, worship of God, acknowledgement of God. These are the sons of God. And they begin cohabitating with the daughters of men, meaning the daughters from the Canaanite uh, Cain's line are those that did not uh, recognize the living God and had turned away from the living God. Most important, we have to see where does this account occur? It occurs in the sixth chapter of Genesis and begins the discussion of the general degradation and depravity that the world had descended into that necessitates the flood. And so that is key, is that these this disorder had gotten to such a point that God's response is going to be the deluge, the flood. And so bottom line, if there ever were these creatures, they died in the flood. Got it. And uh, that's per- pretty much also Dr. Scott Hahn's interpretation. Also, uh, what you just said, Kyle, it's uh, that uh, they're the, the Sethite men that seduced uh, the Canaanite women. And also there's uh, Orthodox scholars that would hold the same position, exactly what you just said. And there's a, a passage in the book of Baruch that... Uh, very interesting it does talk it, it it just acknowledges these this uh the nephilim in baruch chapter 3 verse 26 to 28 it says the giants were born there who were famous of old great in stature expert in war god did not choose them nor give them the way to knowledge so they perished because they had no wisdom they perished through their folly so that, as you said they were wiped out the nephilim were wiped out through the great flood correct that's the bottom line Correct. And so there's no longer a vestige of those. But you bring up a great point is that um, the the church, we always say, what is the sense of fide? What's the sense of the faith? What is the tradition? What has come on? And so this particular subject we see for four centuries is held one way. And then there's a definitive clarification that we get. And then that definitive clarification has held for some 17 centuries or some 16 and a half centuries since. And so the weight of tradition is on the latter interpretation. And it also squares with the use of the term sons of God, daughters of men or sons of men. It squares with those usages in the book of Daniel and later in Deuteronomy and even our Lord's use of the words, uh, son of man, son of God. So um, I think that, you have to look at what is the weight, what has, has the church said for the last 16 centuries in this. And so um, that's going to go to the interpretation um, that these were the Sephite sons that utilized or, or misused their relationship with God to not only seduce, but to subjugate. I think that's the real word is it wasn't a seduction. It was a subjugation. Um they they violently took them. They didn't take them um, in a um, the misuse of their nobility and their relationship with God. Like I mean, rape. We could say rape, right? Or subjugation. You know, there's a, subjugation. Essentially, is one who has favor or nobility subjecting their superiority over another and getting them to uh, either acquiesce or surrender to. Um, what it is they want. So it's not really a subjugation. I mean, it's not really a um, rape. slavery. It's not really a seduction and it's not really a rape. Um, but it's, it's a misuse of authority. It's a misuse of their status. Kyle, this is a big topic we're going to jump into now. And I say this because I know a lot of these priests in this article. I've uh, been around uh, SCRC for 30 years. A lot of good people there. A lot of good priests there. In fact, you've spoken there. And uh, so I don't attribute any 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 malice to anybody in this article. It's just a conversation I want to have with you and just take a look at it. What's good? What's not so good? What squares with tradition? What doesn't square with tradition? To set this up, first of all, I want to say that there's a doctor by the name of Dr. Kenneth McCall. He wrote a book back in the 80s, Healing the Family Tree. Okay, and uh, he talks about this method of healing uh, incurable patients of victims of ancestral control. And uh, in this book, he seeks to liberate them from domination. So he has people drop a family tree. 
He's able to identify the ancestor who's causing his patient harm. He then cuts the bond between the ancestor and patient by celebrating with a clergyman a service of Holy Communion. He's a Protestant, by the way, in which he delivers a tormented ancestor to God. Uh, This book is very popular. He's an Anglican psychiatrist, and the book is called Healing the Family Tree. It was written back in 1982. And the practice of this has now come into the Catholic Church amongst a lot of good, holy, charismatic priests who now practice the family tree mass. And uh, this, this took root, I would say, in Los Angeles and is spread throughout the entire country uh, in, in certain Catholic charismatic groups. So I want to look at an article that I sent you uh, from Spirit Daily, and I want to just uh, ask you questions as we go on. The first one is, it says here, and I have it uh, highlighted in yellow, just the salient parts. It says, for we are all connected past and present. Beyond the visible mission is the need to keep the spirit clean. I think I would agree with that. While proceeding in that endeavor, or the soul and family line is sullied in a way that in, that inhibits its completion. If we have spirits hanging on to us, we must free ourselves of them to fully conclude our assignments from God and clear the family tree of what otherwise will be bondages that may manifest physically, emotionally, or spiritually, in some cases, torturing descendants. So here's my question. I believe that all the baptized are connected in Christ. It's called the communion of saints. Does the rest of the statement that I just read to you, does it line up with tradition? Hold that thought. We'll come back and we're going to go through this article verse by verse. This is Jesus 911. Welcome to our January 11, 2020 Spiritual Warfare Conference. Every year without fail, this is our most popular, well-attended event. This year's Spiritual Warfare Conference will host Adam Bly, a Catholic demonologist, and an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists, along with Dr. Luis Sandoval, a psychiatrist who's part of the Healing, Deliverance, and Exorcism team for the Diocese of Orange. These two gentlemen bring tons of experience and expertise in the area of spiritual warfare. This is going to be a high-information Catholic seminar. I'll be there as well, sharing some riveting stories on the diabolical and liberation found through Jesus Christ from my best-selling book, The Devil in the City of Angels. Mark your calendars, come and join us, and meet other radio hosts from Jesus 911. Contrary to popular belief, spiritual warfare is not demon-centered. It's Christ-centered. Come join us and learn how to armor up and fight the good fight of faith. Catholics, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Join us at St. Christopher Catholic Church, 629 South Glendora Avenue, West Covina, California, on January 11, 2020. See you then. Strength and honor in Jesus' name. Jesus said to the apostles in Luke chapter 10, Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. According to St. Boniface, in her voyage across the ocean of this world, the church is like a great ship being pounded by the waves of life's different stresses. Our duty is not to abandon ship, but to keep her on course. May our Lord help us remain ever faithful to his church to aid and defend her. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888 526 2151. Welcome back, Jesus 911. Three man car today. We have Kyle Clement from Libra Cristo helping us uh, break down some of these topics. Let me uh, restate the question, uh, Kyle, before you uh, jump into your answer. And actually, let me do this real quick. On the previous segment, we were talking about uh, the Cephites 
and the Canaanites, or the Canaanites, I should say. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, uh, the Canaanites were one of the, the, uh, the, the uh, their ancestors refused to accept the, uh, the God of, of, uh, of the Old Testament. Let me ask you this. Is there, I'm going to make an observation and you tell me whether I'm close or far. Uh, is there a connection between uh, victimhood and maybe the, the refusal to accept God and maybe that's what, uh, how, how evil uh, enters there? I mean, is there, is there some kind of uh, correlation between being a victim and, uh, and uh, you know, being afflicted with uh, demonic uh, influence? You are the man. <laughs> this, this, connection, this connection begs to be discussed. I'll take you to the fourth chapter of Genesis. God himself is giving spiritual direction to Cain. The scene is that God has just accepted Abel's sacrifice, and he's uh, not found favor with Cain's sacrifice. God speaking to Cain, why are you crestfallen? In modern psychobabble, that is, why do you have low self-esteem? <laughs> right. Yes. And so in this, he says, first of all, why are you crestfallen? Crestfallen. And then he says, sin is a demon lurking at your door, but you can master it if you do good. Listen to God himself speaking and making the linkage between sin and the demon. And it's at your door. It's lurking. It's crouching. It's waiting for you to take action or to make word against God. And then you and the demon are in league. In that moment, you are now simpatico. You are now joined. Interesting. And so what, and so what Cain did was he took spiritual direction from God and says, no, I'm going to eliminate the competition. I'm going to, I'm going to kill my brother. And he does so. And so it is that sense of victimhood, that sense of um, disordered injustice that drives us away from God. Because Cain's other response was, thanks be to God for sending me a brother who is pure of heart, who that I might emulate, who that I might imitate, and therefore grow closer to God. Cain goes the other way. Got it. Got it. Amazing. Amazing. Good. And you know what? That uh, prompts a whole other discussion we can have on another day. But right now, let's fast forward to, to, to the next article and Jess's question. I'm going to repeat the question for you, Kyle. Here it is. He says, uh, so uh, I believe all the baptized are connected in Christ. That's the communion of saints. Does the rest of the statement line up with tradition? That's the question. Okay, so we need some clarification. There are a couple of terms used in there that I think will give us some insight. Define the mission. What is the mission? Hmm. It says beyond the visible mission is, is the need to keep the spirit clean. Or, or the soul and family line is sullied in a way that inhibits its completion. That's the mission. So what is the mission? To keep the spirit clean. I guess to live in a state of grace, I'm guessing. I'm guessing. Now, we're, I, if we're looking at the 18th chapter of Matthew and we go to our Lord for definitions as the primary source, the great commission or the great mission that he sends all of us on oh, is to yeah. proclaim the gospel baptize okay and and so i think that we have to be clear on the mission the mission is not to live uh the walt disney happy ever after life with 2.5 cars for you know <laughs> fill in the right. blanks for the dream the mission is to bring souls to christ amen and so i think that then to touch back on what uh eddie was saying with regard to victimhood is we are paralyzed in that mission if we see ourselves as a victim or if we look at any obstacle as being other than our own. And I think that's the real danger in this he whole healing of the family tree thing is it doesn't square with Catholic theology who, when we look at sin or we look at ruptured relationship, the first words out of our Catholic mouth should be mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, my fault, my fault, my most grievous fault. You will find there is, I'll draw a couple of correlations just from an observation standpoint. And you're right, Jesse. I know a lot of these priests, good men. They all know you. <laughs> yes. are, and, and I know a bunch of the, the men that are engaged in this. And a lot of times their compassion is used against them. 
but it starts as a slow creep, a slow liturgical creep from ad orientum to ad hominem. We turn away from the creature and toward away from the creator and turn toward the creature. Mm. It's amazing the number of these guys who have chosen alternate penitential rites. They're not using the confidior in their own masses because they don't want to call the people into account. The confidior, penitential rite option one. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned. More often what we hear is, let us call to mind our sins as we contemplate these mysteries. And then the permanent deacon immediately starts the stroke. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. That's right. And we don't even have time to reflect. Exactly. On our- and so what happens is with this healing of the family tree, when we focus any rupture on relationship away from ourselves, then we find ourselves in the confessional confessing the sins of others, not to the exclusion of our own sins. It's not my fault that I did these things because Uncle Bob was a womanizer. So now when temptation comes my way, it's Uncle Bob's fault. It's not my fault. Ah, that's good. I like that. Very interesting. That makes sense. It diverts responsibility. Yeah, I'm not responsible for being a drug addict because... My I had drug addicts uh, in my family for the last five generations, so that's why I'm a drug addict. Exactly. So it, removes, not- it, it removes personal responsibility. Precisely. Precisely. And Cain, if we put it in Cain speak, what Cain's essentially saying is, if it's it, without Abel, I've got the best sacrifice on the face of the earth. Mm. So God should be happy with what I'm doing. Cain makes me look bad. I mean, nice. Abel makes me look bad. Yes. Eddie, let's move on to the next question. Yeah, there's that's, a lot of that's, stuff here. Yeah, that's, yeah. There's a lot of stuff to yeah, break down. Let's okay, let's go to the next paragraph. Uh, I have seen so many cases in the past 35 years that I could not even count them all or tell you all the cases we've had with, with this kind of a familial spirit, wrote Stella Davis, a Catholic laywoman from Virginia who has uh, ministered around the world. The same sickness in one generation will go on in the bloodline. This is called the spirit of infirmity going through several generations. We go to the root of this sickness in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. We cut out the spirit of infirmity, cast it out of the person, and send it to Jesus. Here's the question, Kyle. This is a charism-centered and, and, uh, on, and, and person-centered. Would this, uh, would this be an example of stepping out of their line of authority? Very well stated. It's exactly what it is. Not only are they outside their line of authority, but there, there's a presumption Um, there is a great presumption on their part. But I think that your first point is the primary point, is they're outside their line of authority. Got it. Okay, good, good. And a a lot of this, again, Kyle, that I noticed, because I've been around this for years, and I know all the people, they're good people, they mean well, they love Jesus, they try to practice their faith. But a lot of this is charism and person-centered. People will say in the neighborhood, go to that person. So Jane Doe, on Wednesdays, you know, they pray for you, and she's got the gift of healing and deliverance. Go to that church on Tuesday night. That prayer group has the gift of healing and deliverance. And so I notice it, it, it could happen because, you know, we're, we're human beings. You can get the cult of personality amongst the Catholic parishes or Catholic culture, and you start People start looking at you kind of like a Catholic guru, and that's not good, A, for your humility, and B, uh, you're putting yourself in harm's way. Uh, You're you're opening yourself up to retaliation. Am I right? You're absolutely right, Jesse. You're absolutely right. And what really suffers here is the church, uh, is the mystical body of Christ. And, And to give you an idea of where I'm going with that, Libra Cristo promotes itself or or what doesn't really promote it just simply states a a truth that we are the catholic approach the catholic approach to liberation what does that mean it means that the catholic approach always has been a return to the sacraments it is a return to the sacraments a return to the state of grace by confessing your sins by doing your penance and living making a firm amendment to change your life That's why we say we're the Catholic approach, because this is what the church has always said. 
And when you're, you make a good point, go here, go there. No one's telling them, go to your knees, go to confession. <laughs> That's where they need to go. Yeah. yeah. Ground zero, your knees. Exactly. <laughs> I can see how this totally ignores the, 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 the divinity, the, 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 authority of Jesus Christ. This is, this is an incredible uh, uh, alternative to going to Christ is coming to a prayer group that has this, this uh, like Jess said, this, this, uh, a, a, a cult authority here that they're, they're having to do with healing. They're associated with healing, and it's not the group. It's Jesus Christ, and that's what the church needs to turn back and, to. And here's also what I see, Eddie. I see that oftentimes well-intentioned people yes. are diverting people to a prayer group, which I'm sure it has some effect. If you got people praying for you, you know, if God feels like like moving uh, as a result of those prayers, he will. But that takes second fiddle to the sacraments. We should be moving these people that are potentially energumens or people that are spiritually afflicted. We need to move them to the sacraments, to their parish priest versus to the prayer group that has people with strong personalities. I think what we do is, instead of sending them to the A team, the sacraments, we're sending people through the B team, through the system. Am I right, Kyle? You're absolutely right, Jesse. I think there's another element here that we want to bring into the mix to, 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 to think about, and that is this. All of these methodologies of healing are focused around the cessation of physical suffering or physical discomfort. This is not Catholic. End of, end of statement. This is simply not Catholic. What the priest should teach you to do or help you to do through the sacraments is join your suffering to Christ so that your suffering has salvific value, so that it has um, a, a benefit to the mystical body of Christ, so that we are making up the suffering that is lacking, St. Paul, quoting St. Paul, and so when St. Paul says, I'm making up what is lacking in the suffering of Christ, in the body of Christ, he's not saying that the passion was deficient. What he's saying is what the passion lacks is your joining. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, stay with us. Uh, on the other side of the break, we're going to continue with this uh, examination of an article on Spirit Daily. We'll be right back. Jesus 911. Rich. got Ernesto from Long Beach. You know, I just wanted to comment, you know, and I just wanted to thank you guys. And I kind of wanted to encourage people that are listening, maybe that are not donating, you know, because honestly, I got to be honest, I used to think you guys were a little too over the top, time, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, you that's know, right. If God gave us a lot, you know, and I'm, I have the blessing of listening to all this. I just want to call all the people, you know, I got five kids, you know, and I don't make a lot of money and I'm still donating to you guys. God bless you, brother. You're amazing. We gotta, we have to do this. We have to do the extra. And it's not even the extra. People see it like it's extra. Kneeling for communion, saying your rosary, saying the divine mercy chaplet. It is not extra. It's what the church tells us to do. Amen. You're a good man, brother. 30 years old, 29 years old, five kids, and I thank you guys. So everybody else, man, get on fire. Fight for the truth, man. I know what I'm telling you guys. There's I so love it. Out there. Hi, this is Eddie Chavez, host of Jesus 911. 
I want to take this opportunity to let you, our listeners, know about an event being held here at the Sacred Heart Chapel in Covina. We will be celebrating the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel on September 28th, 2019, beginning at 9 o'clock with Mass in the morning and talks to follow. Ruben Nava and myself will be speaking, so come and hear us talk about St. Michael and Our Lady. Come join us, and we'll see you there. or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org 877-LIFE-US1 Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Soul Patrol Jesus 911. That's exactly the mission of the Catholic faith. Go out and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's all about winning souls. On Wednesday, we got a three-man car on Wednesdays. I love it because... It's usually throughout the week, it's a two-man car. And sometimes Eddie and me, we're kicking down doors, and sometimes we can't kick the door down. So on Wednesdays, we bring in the battering ram. And, and when we bring in the battering ram on Wednesdays, trust me, every door comes down. <laughs> the battering ram is Kyle Clement, Dan Schneider from Libra Christo. They're, they're instructors on healing, deliverance, and exorcism. And uh, I call, I, I tell Eddie, these guys are like the top of the food chain when it comes to the, the, these topics. Yeah. Here's another question, Kyle, on an, on an article called Family Healing, the Genogram. Uh, it, the article says, sometimes the affliction skips a generation. Sometimes it's a demon. Sometimes it's an ancestral spirit, which is discerned when a spirit barks out that it's not going because that has been there a long time. Some go to the second, third, and fourth generations. Sometimes they're on both sides of the family, father and mother. But the great thing is that they are set, that they are set free. To see the faces of people when they come in and when they go out, your eyes sometimes cannot believe they are the same people. They leave with happy faces, joyful hearts, and freedom from their bondage. My question to you, does the bulk of that statement line up with scripture and tradition? What what's the is there any problems with it or is it uh, does it pass the mustard? Uh, there's lots of problems with it. There's there's lots <laughs> of issues, and so what happens is um, we look at you throw a lot of things in there. Some of the terms have validity, but to clarify the use of terms, first of all, let's go through. Um, there is some disparity in various literature, especially in Protestant literature and nouveau Catholic literature about familial spirits, generational spirits, and ancestral spirits. And so to clear this up, the way that Liber Cristo uses the language, the way the Leo the Thirteenth Institute uses the language, the way Father Ripperger uses it, there's some consistency. And so I'll give you those definitions, and that might help our discussion. Because depending upon what article or author you're reading, you're going to get different meanings for those words. So Let's talk about a familial spirit. A familial spirit would be as um, Father Hampsch would call it, exterior or an extrinsic evil, meaning it hangs around on the exterior. Now, some examples of this are suicide, divorce, these things. Once that spirit is allowed access to the family through practice, then it's going to be a viable option for anyone facing discomfort, alcoholism, drug use, these things. Because what it is, what the universal um, attachment that this has is a desire on the person's part to escape suffering or some reality that is theirs. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, yeah, correct. And so then they look at the family and say, okay, how did my dad deal with this? How did my grandfather deal with this? 
if it's divorce, if the vocation of marriage gets tough and it starts to get really uh, arduous, meaning it's really worth a lot of grace, when it starts to get hard, that's when they say, okay, granddad didn't put up with this, dad didn't put up with this, so now I'm the third in my line uh, to give in to divorce. Each time it's given into, it becomes easier. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Makes perfect sense. I'll give you an example. In my family, on both sides of my family, going back to all known history, there was never a divorce. In my generation, among my 21 cousins, there are four divorcees. So it never shows up, and then all of a sudden it does. Look at the divorces of children who were the products of divorce. And so you see it spreads exponentially. Now, this is not totally demonic. What it counts on or what it relies on is our fallen nature, our uh, aversion to suffering, our aversion to the difficult, the arduous. The definition of the virtue of fortitude is the willingness to engage the arduous. Kyle, you know what? You said something that I can tell you experientially. It's I, I've, I've seen this. I've been around the charismatic renewal for over 30 years, since my late 20s. I know all the people in this article. I know virtually all of them across the country. Good men, mean well, uh, m- m- pious men. But I can tell you this. I've heard a lot of talks in my life on healing on uh, you know being set free on uh, on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and that's all good because a lot of that stuff is in Scripture, but I've never heard any presentations. I'm telling you, in 30 years, amongst the charismatic renewal on redemptive suffering, and you talked about that a, a while ago in the last segment. I've learned about that on my own by reading the saints and doctors of the church and reading the tradition of the church. But that's definitely, in my experience, that's not something that's talked about. It's or it's at the very least, it's de-emphasized. It's always the promotion of healing, healing, psychological healing, mental healing, emotional healing, physical healing. And then I say, wait a minute. Well, Jesus Christ says, if we want to follow Him and be His disciples, we got to pick up our cross. That's kind of an instrument of suffering and torture. And so that's that's just a, a, an observation on my part that is lacking in the charismatic renewal, there's an overemphasis on Jesus is going to heal all your problems and heal everybody all the way back to your Masonic, uh, you know, 10th degree grandfather, great, 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 great grandfather. But there's not a lot of talk about, uh, about, about redemptive suffering, which is something that's rooted in Scripture, as you just quoted Colossians 124. Is my observation valid? Is that a valid critique? It's absolutely valid. It's absolutely Catholic. And and to put it in another term, redemptive suffering is kryptonite to the charismatic healer. Oh, gosh. Mm. And you know, put it that way. Wow. Eddie? But because stop and think about it. If you're going to tell the person that their suffering has redemptive value and that they should do whatever it takes to get rid of the discomfort, then where's the need for this emotional consolation, this feel good experience? You know what, Kyle, it's so, it's so funny that we're talking about this today. Just 12 hours ago, I was interviewing somebody who, was, who was, has all the medical background, medical testing, uh, everything you can think of. Nobody can find what's wrong with him. Very, very difficult to understand him speak, hobbles around with a cane. Last night, I asked him, when was the last time you went to confession? Over 10 years. This is what we're talking about, Kyle. We're, we're talking about coming back to the sacraments. Uh, and, and, you know, like I think it was, uh, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't you, Kyle, it was uh, Dan, that said, you know, affliction from the demonic comes in through mortal sin and then it remains through a heresy. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a heresy these individuals had that, that, that I spoke with last night, this, this team, this, this uh, married team. And uh, they both had a heresy. And uh, it's just amazing what, what the devil can do with no medical issue whatsoever. You would think this guy had had a stroke, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's what we're talking. We're talking about uh, being afflicted 
And is that does that does that sound familiar to you? I'm sure that it does. Oh, absolutely. We hear it over and over and over again. I I, I really think that we need to stay at this at this point um, in our discussions, uh, not just today. I'm not saying stay here today, but we need to always come back to this original premise that redemptive suffering is preserved only in the Catholic Church, and it's under severe attack even within our church. But the bottom line is that it militates against faith if we pursue avoidance of the cross, if we want to avoid suffering, if we want to avoid doing reparation, if we want to avoid these things, then this is directly against the sacraments. It's directly against what our Lord said. It's in it's in bold opposition to Catholicism. And that's a How natural, that, isn't that a natural reflex to avoid suffering? Isn't it something that we have to, that, that we, we, we feel we have to avoid, I mean, and naturally speaking? Well, I think you bring up a very good point. It's a lower faculty response. It's the instinct or preservation of the corpus that is overcome through the intellect. And what has been systematically removed from daily prayer and observance is the martyrology. The martyr shows you exactly the value of subjecting the lower faculties to the upper faculty of the intellect. When all he has to do is say, I recant, I, I denounce the Lord, I turn away from the Lord. That's all he has to do to live. But he accepts martyrdom. That's the, the intellect and the will overriding the lower faculty. And the most poignant ones... Example after example in the old martyrology, you've got sweet Agnes, 11-year-old girl, who guides the trembling hand of the executioner so that he might make good her martyrdom. She's more resolved to die than he is to kill her. She wasn't praying for healing, was she? No, she wasn't. <laughs> no, she wasn't, Jess. Hey, hey, Kyle, you know something very interesting? Uh, even Benny Hinn, a very famous... Protestant prosperity gospel preacher on television. He just came out recently denouncing the prosperity gospel. It's it's like Benny Hinn, who's made millions of dollars promoting this false gospel that God always heals, you know, emotion, body, everything. He's now renouncing his ministry of 30 years. He says, this is not true. God doesn't always heal. And, uh... <laughs> So it's, it looks like he had a red pill moment, and uh, we'll continue with this topic with a three-man car. Don't change that dial. Welcome, Daniel. You're on the line. What's on your mind, brother? Hi, I just wanted to share a testimony about Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I had a buddy at work who, you know, he's a lukewarm Catholic guy, and I wanted him to start listening to the Terry and Jesse show, so I kept telling him to download the app, and he kept putting me off. So one day, I grabbed his phone, and I downloaded the app <laughs> for him. I went on vacation, and you know, I kept telling him to listen to it. He was kind of put me off. I came back from vacation. He comes to my cubicle, and he says to me, Hey, man, I've been listening to Terry and Jesse's show, and it's great. And it's uh, made a big impact in his life. The guy, he's going to weekly adoration a couple times a wow. week. He goes to the Mass in the morning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he's an uh, on-fire Catholic, and he promotes uh, the Terry and Jesse show on the Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Wow. Daniel, what a testimony. And I want to encourage our listeners to get those cards by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and uh, do what Daniel's doing. Go out and spread the faith by inviting people to listen to Virgin Most Powerful. Daniel, thanks for your testimony, brother. God love you. You're welcome. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. According to St. John Paul II, being a Christian means saying yes to Jesus Christ. It consists in surrendering to the word of God and relying on it, but also endeavoring to know better and better the profound meaning of this word. May God grant that we always rely on His Word, read it often, and put it into practice.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Three-man oh. car, 10-8 on duty. We got uh, two field officers, and we got our sharpshooter in the back seat, Kyle Clement. Just on, Wednesday, on, on Wednesdays, Eddie, we roll three deep. Yeah, we do, and it's a pleasure to do so. Kyle, let me, let me ask you something. Uh, we uh, Kind of a side note here. We have a, one of the live streamers here asking about speaking in tongues. And, and, I, and I had kind of a similar question with that. I, I think that's a whole show, Eddie. I, I, <laughs> we're not going to do it justice. No, no, no. I know we're not. Let's, let's do a whole show on that because we're not going to do it justice, really. I, you know, I got the question. Unless you want to tackle it quick, Kyle, but I would like to do a whole show on that. That's a whole 60 minutes. That, that's not a flipping statement. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, my, my part of that was that one of these priests that we're talking about one time uh, during the Eucharistic prayer, uh, elevating the host, uh, began to speak in tongues. It so happens all the time. They we, do it all the time from, yeah. east coast, from east to west. They it, do it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we can, we can tackle that another time. I just yeah, thought, let's tackle it another okay. time so we can do a good job because that, this, yeah, I, I don't, let, let's, let's, stick, let's stick to the healing of the family tree because there's a lot of good questions here. All right, Kyle, so, we just, uh, we're just rushing Kyle here. Kyle, <laughs> I'm not sure if you have enough time for all this. Uh, no, that's no, no, no. Uh, we, we, we're going to pray that God gives him long life so exactly. we, can, uh, we can bring in uh, our sharpshooter every Wednesday. We can go through all these topics, but we'll do, we got to do it slowly. We got to unpeel it slowly. So, uh, yeah, uh, as I told you about Benny Hinn, he's having a red pill moment. Benny Hinn also was asked recently, they asked him, uh, in what church are there more miracles? Benny Hinn said, the church that has more miracles than any other church in the world is the Catholic Church. I almost fell off my chair when I read it, and they asked Benny Hinn, what? There's more miracles in the Catholic Church than any other? He goes, he goes yes, because they have the Eucharist. So I just, that's a, kind of a side note. I think he's having a conversion. Who knows? Maybe he may go through RCIA one of these days. But let's, let's jump on into the next topic, uh, next uh, question. Uh, go ahead. Just, uh, yeah. I, I, lost my, I lost my place here. Go ahead. And, uh, I, I, I know to, where I'm at here. Yeah, it go says, ahead. Uh, it says, uh, a fine new book on exorcism and deliverance called Slain Dragons, confirming the idea. In spiritual warfare, there is something called the generational spirit. This is a demon who is particularly focused on attacking members of a certain family. This demon enters through the authority structure that God permitted and typically comes in through a sin committed by the father of the family. So, Kyle, does this statement line up with scripture and tradition? Yes. Um, I think in two places you, you get affirmation of this use of the term generational spirit. And so there are two differentiations. Let me take the first one so we can move it to the side. The first differentiation is a spirit which aff afflicts a generation or an age of people, um, meaning a zeitgeist or spirit of the age. For instance, in, in the 60s, it was sexual promiscuity. In the 80s, it was greed. Uh, and so that's one use of generational spirit. The more common use and the one that this author is referring to is a spirit which is given a formal right to be present to the flesh of a family over a period of time. God himself in Deuteronomy um, and also I believe in the book of Numbers says that he will allow this to the third and fourth generation. And the quote is, for those who bless me, I will bless them, God speaking. For those who curse me, I will curse them to the third and fourth generation. And so what he's saying is for those who actively militate against God, against God's people, um, then that spirit is going to be present to those people to the third and fourth generation. It's not a possession. It means that they have a right to be present because those descendants were pledged. 
Now, there's a lot of articles out there that where modern theologians almost get this right. Um, but because of modernism and relativism, they get parts of it right, but then they shy away from the, the idea that our actions have consequences that go beyond us. And so Freemasonry, certain types of witchcraft, blood witchcraft, blood oaths, a lot of the Norse uh, um, practices, a lot of Russian witchcraft, a lot of these things draw upon the pledge of the descendants. And a person grows in uh, status or power in the, on the demonic side through the offering of blood sacrifice, through the offering of um, their descendants. And so it's this pledge which allows a curse to be present, the curse in the form of a demon, to be present down to the third and fourth generation. You find this in uh, the Freemasonic curse. This is a show, a standalone show um, about Freemasonry is not the unique one, but Freemasonry was constructed to militate against the church, to understand that it was to undo the effects and to militate against sanctifying grace. And so when you see it that way, then you see what is actually being done in spiritual warfare. Got it. Uh, we got Kyle Clement on Three Man Card. This is Jesus 911. We're talking about the the book by Dr. Kenneth McCall, an Anglican psychiatrist called Healing the Family Tree. Uh, it's use also in the Catholic Church. It's widespread use in the Catholic Church. And uh, just by the way, for, for that person in the chat room that wanted to know about speaking in tongues, go on the Internet, go on YouTube, and type in Father Chad Ripperger on speaking in tongues. He has two responses. There's two short clips. One's like five minutes, one's like three minutes on the whole speaking in tongues, the nature of tongues from based on sacred tradition and the fathers of the church. So type in Father Ripperger speaking in tongues and you will get your answer. But I promise we'll do a show with Kyle uh, in the near future on this topic entirely. Eddie, what's the next uh, question we have? For- yeah, this is a, this is where it, where it comes from. It says, uh, it can travel within the family and down through the family line through marriages. Removing generational spirits is one reason why there are exorcisms in the traditional right uh, of baptism. These baptismal exorcisms are also done to ensure the child is not burdened under any curse placed there as a means of revenge against the family. This specific problem is more prevalent in Europe. Now, I know that the prayers in the traditional rite of baptism are, are more exorcistic. Uh, is, it, is this a true statement, that the exorcisms in the traditional rite of baptism are to remove generational spirits? That's the question. Not specifically. Um, they do address generational spirits, but they're not specific. The thing about the generational curse is that it, it is almost constantly and subconsciously um, affirmed within a family. For instance, and I, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is functional theology. This is where we get it wrong. If you are the, the um, under a Freemasonic curse, one of those elements is that it demands sacrifice of the procreative principle. So if you're third generation, fourth generation, and you're practicing contraception, you are confirming that sin against the procreative principle. And so if you're contracepting, this is against doctrine and dogma of the church, regardless of being able to find a priest who will tell you it's okay. This is where we're drawn into ignorance, mass ignorance, but where we are subject to um, our, our acts have consequences. And so the demon will say that is being that curse is being affirmed by this behavior. Does that make sense? Yes, it yep, does. Absolutely. Yeah, it does. Yep. Kyle, I got another question. We're going to be we're coming up to an end and we're going to have to pick up on this topic next time we have you on, because this is going to be at least a part two or a part three type of show, because this is a huge topic. Healing the Family Tree by Dr. Kenneth McCall and how it's basically spilled into the Catholic Church and uh, and some of the some of the things that are good and some of the things that are not so good about this program. The article says, according to another experts, curses levied by someone related by blood, a relative are the most powerful, long lasting and dangerous. My question, is this a true statement? Yes. 
Got it. Now, is there is there what's the reason uh, for that, Kyle? What, what's the reason that a family member that uh, does one of these curses uh, has has more power, so to speak, than like a witch or something, or yeah, shaman exactly. or something? The thing about a curse is always to remember that a curse is a counterfeit of a blessing. And so the language of blessing is love. The language of curse is hate. A family member is capable of more hatred and more um, Mm. egregious behavior against another family member. (laughs) If you don't believe me, go through probate. Um, Mm. Wow. You watch the cruelty of one family member to another. There is a total absence of charity so they can not only love on a deeper level, they can hate on a deeper level and they can become vengeful on a deeper level. That makes sense. So it is that proximity, that intimacy that allows. um, I'll put it to another way. Eddie, you got brothers and sisters? Yes, brother. Does he know where your buttons are? My buttons? Oh, yeah, definitely. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. So we've just spoken the language of cursing is when we manipulate another's buttons or vulnerable points to take them to a compromised psychological or spiritual state, we're cursing them. We're we're using their vulnerability to our advantage. And so that's a form of cursing. Incidentally, you know, I can tell you how to get rid of that. Keep him from ever pushing your buttons again. You want to know it? Yeah, please. Yeah, of course. Get, get rid of your buttons. <laughs> you know, you know, Kyle, it's funny because this kind of has a, a physical dynamic to it, too, because it reminds me of crimes of passion. Crimes of passion uh, committed from one family member to the next are much more violent than a, a crime, a, a potential crime with, with, with strangers. And so you see a lot more uh, a physical uh, contact with family members that have uh, relational issues where, where it becomes physical uh, in, in, this, in this context that we're talking about. You're exactly right, and it's built up around one common topic, and that is unforgiveness. Mm. And wow. so... I- and harbor a grudge. I can, you can be my brother and I can harbor a grudge for 30 years. And so when I do strike you, one punch is not going to be enough because there's a 30 year eruption that's behind that first punch. And so had I been forgiving you truly and praying for your conversion all this time, you don't get that buildup. In order mm. for a to work, there has to be unforgiveness. Kyle, wow. well, I hear the music. Thank you very much. This is a Jesus 911 three man car. On Wednesdays, we bring in our sharpshooters, Kyle and Dan. Thanks, Kyle. We'll have to do this again. Just want to mention that tonight I'm going to be in Buckeye, Arizona, speaking to the Conservative American Latino Organization on how to vote like a Catholic tonight, 6 to 9 p.m. at Montessori Academy. And uh, up next, Gary Machuda, Sensei Gary, hands-on apologetics. Eddie, wrap it up. Thanks so much, Kyle. We'll, uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. If not, we'll get to you sooner or later whenever you have a chance. Jesus 911. Talk to you on the other side. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests. O my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole church, grant it love and the light of thy spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great high priest, may the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.